So welcome to our forum, Colombianas Wielding Power, in conversation with Ms. Natalia Cortez. We are proud to co-sponsor this event with War Sisters League and a firm international led by Ninochka Roska. And we also thank the People's Forum for this wonderful space. So just an overview of this evening's program. Let me see, I'm wondering if we would like to give the floor to the coordinator of international projects for, yes, I'm gonna just give an overview and, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> So uh, that's Miss uh, Renata Pomarol. She's gonna uh, address the audience briefly, and then we're gonna go on to Genevieve Rana of a firm New York, who will talk about uh, a firm and its international community's work, and then Tori Smith Smith of uh, War Sisters League will talk about their work, and also he will expand more on the right to refuse to kill program of War Sisters International. And then he will also formally introduce our special guest. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Renata uh, with the People's Forum. How many of you have been at the People's Forum before? OK, many of you. OK, so welcome again. Um, I'm the coordinator of international projects. Um, and I just wanted to let you know a little bit that in a little bit of um, more than a year, at the People's Forum, we, we have become we have uh, become a reference uh, for international struggle. Um, we have become a space where people can come together, uh, challenge, and organize against sanctions in Venezuela, right here uh, in the belly of the empire. Uh, we have become a space where um, Puerto Ricans fighting for self de determination against the junta and against the cancellation of the debt can uh, unite uh, and find common ground with uh, the people from Western Sahara. Um, and of course, we have also uh, are happy to welcome our Colombian comrades um, here and discuss a ver uh, the very important issue about uh, women in struggle in Colombia and against the war. Um, so I'd like to welcome the space to affirm War Resisters League and Natalia. Welcome everyone. Good evening everyone. Uh, my name is Jenny Rana and I'm a member of Affirm New York chapter. Um, we are Affirm. Um, we are a national organization of women engaged in intersectional feminist anti-imperialist activism and dedicated to the fight against oppression in all forms. We have a diverse, multi-ethnic uh, membership committed to militant movement building and effects and, and effects change through grassroots organizing, trans-ethnic alliance building, education, advocacy, and direct action. We have chapters around the country, with the two brand newest chapters being Chicago and Puerto Rico. Um, in, in, in our international work, we are focused on shedding light on the sale of women and children across borders and support all women's organizations, which make women's right priority for their national agenda. Uh, we are very proud to co-sponsor this program with War Sisters League, and we're, um, we're proud to present to you to, um, and to, to, get to, um, to learn more about our speaker's work. Um, and to introduce her is Tori Smith of War Sisters League. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Tori Smith. I'm the national campaigner with War Resisters League. Um, so War Resisters League, very briefly, is we're an anti-militarist organization, 95 years old, um, and our relationship uh, is to Natalia and some of her work is War Resisters League is a very big believer in transnational movement building and internationalism. War Resisters International is the national is the international umbrella organization. Um, that over uh, 60 different organizations um, are all a part of uh, to build a global anti-militarist movement and really move some of that work. Um, so one of the things that War Resisters League believes very strongly is that not only should we be trying to struggle against war and militarism, but also the root causes of 
what drives war and militarism throughout the globe. And one of those root causes that we believe really strongly is that militarism and patriarchy are incredibly intertwined and part of mutually reinforcing systems um, that continue to continue to drive oppression of especially women throughout the globe. Um, so that is why we're very, very excited to share some space with Affirm, a transnational feminist organization, a fellow anti-imperialists, and we're really, really excited to be able to share space with y'all and build together. Um, I met Natalia and some of her work um, earlier this year in a conference that Natalia and Wars Sisters International helped lead in um, helped lead in Bogota. Um, and really one of the things that um, most impressed me about her work was also the way that she was bringing a very sharp and critical feminist lens to the anti-militarist organizing that WRI is doing across the globe. Um, and so I'm so excited to have her here, share a little bit about some, what the shape of some of her work looks like in Colombia and give us some of the background and updates from the ground on what's happening in Colombia today around um, the peace process, the struggle against militarism, and feminist feminist organizing across Colombia. Great. So um, I always start like saying where is Colombia because probably not many people know, or you can know, but it, it happens that people don't know where is it. Um, so um, it's like in the north of South America and. Um, yeah, we are like bounded in the north by the Caribbean Sea, uh, the north is by Panama, um, in the south by both Ecuador and Peru, um, and the east by Venezuela, the south is by Brazil, and the west by the Pacific. And yeah, we are like, Colombia comprises 32 departments uh, with the capital in Bogota, that is just in the middle of the map. Um, so yeah, I was just thinking how to start this conversation with you and um, yeah, I thought that it was good to share uh, my personal experience like in the feminist movement and I think that is the starting point if you are not feminist, <laughs> like sharing your own experience. Um, so yeah, like before university I never, I didn't know like, I didn't know like what, what was feminism or like I wasn't like involved in any social movement. I don't know if it's like because my, well, Colombian's uh, education system or like I wasn't like influenced by this, like, but like feminist people. Uh, but when I started like at the university, we, we were having like this really strong struggle with the student movement because some law was going to be passed in the Congress and it was like really bad like with public education. So I got like really involved with that and yeah, with many, yeah, like student movements and groups, but like I always felt like something was, wasn't right. Like uh, every time like some other girls and me like tried like to bring up some issues that we thought that it was important for women. Um, yeah, that, that always was like, oh no, like for later. Like we can, we can discuss this, um, yeah, like another moment. So that's why like I stopped like being involved with this the student movement, not because I don't think it's uh, good or they are not doing like good work, but because yeah, it wasn't like fulfilling me. Um, so yeah, um, so I start. <laughs> Actually, this is like the current mayor, like yeah, like the elected mayor, like two weeks ago. Um, so yeah, I start like working with this uh, feminist group in my university. I studied first like in a private university and then like, I passed to a public one. So yeah, I, I started like, to get involved in this kind of like discussions and it was like really interesting for me and like seeing um, yeah, how many things that people like taught us like in the past like wasn't right and like we as women are like women are like really prompt like to be violent, be violent by someone, um, men usually. So yeah, so I brought like some <laughs> pictures of like what we have done, like the university. Um, yeah, and currently I'm just working with uh, women in their own neighborhoods. We have facilitated many workshops uh, about like uh, women's rights and 
yeah, like rights in general and how um, women can like access to many things that they don't know they exist. Um, so yeah, that is like yeah, that is like the last picture like I took like in a protest um, because yeah we have like a strike in the university. Um, so yeah, we are just like asking for public and feminist education. We'll see if we get it <laughs> sometime soon. So yeah, uh, so I will start like telling you like a bit of the movement history, and I just took all of these like dates and like yeah like chronology uh, from uh, this author. Um, so yeah, we start well the feminist movement like started to be really strong in the 70s, like in Colombia, and we call it like the second wave. I think you have like similar things here, <laughs> and it was like influenced mostly by like socialist ideas and like. Um, like the union struggles um, and universities that was really influenced by left-wing left-wing parties. Um, so yeah, that was like more or less like the 70s, uh, like women trying to put like the women agenda in the unions and like universities whole agendas in general. Uh, but at that point, like the the like a break-in started. Uh, because there were like some women that didn't want to be depending on like the this kind of um, class struggle because it was always like that. I think like it happens the same with me and with those women that they were feeling like they were like the second priority. Um, so yeah, they, there started, it, it started like a, a split between the independent feminists. I don't know how to translate it well and like the political parties, feminists. Um, so yeah, they, they were start like to, like splitting and like having like some tension between like the whole movement. And then in 1981, uh, there was like the first feminist conference in, of Lat in Latin America and the Caribbean. And since that point, like the, like the breaking was just uh, really clear. Um, many organizations like started at that conference, so even like organizations that are that is still existing, like in Colombia. Um, but what they start to do is like to how they can include their own like agenda in the struggle of the like filing a new constitution, like that the constitution of 1991 is our more more recent one and it's like the current one. So uh, the Political parties, feminist, were just trying like to include all the agenda for women, uh, but that was like a discussion with the state and the government and the independent feminists. Um, yeah, didn't like uh, that because um, yeah, they were trying like to approach um, and to make like a change from the roots and not like only expecting to the state to do anything, everything for them. So yeah, that's mainly like from the 90s and then in 2000 I think like the armed conflict got like worse and worse and worse uh, so that took a lot of the agenda of the women and feminist movement because when you have lived in a country where where less like 50 or 40 years like in civil war and internal conflict um, that's why it's your main concern because women were, were trying like to um, say that the conflict was, was affecting women um, in a different way. Um, so yeah, that took like a lot of the agenda <laughs> of, of the feminist movement. And then when, in 2012, is when the peace agreements and the peace process started. Um, so there's like a huge, um, I don't know, like, how do I say it? Um, yeah, contribution to the peace process. Uh, with this like sub gender commission um, because they were going to the uh, to Cuba just like to tell people that uh, we need that you're including the peace agreements that we need like different uh, ways like to solve the conflict because conflict has like an impact like a differentiate impact uh, in us on us but I don't know <laughs> um, so yeah it was like really really important and there's no no other uh, peace agreements around the world but that includes uh, a gender perspective approach. So um, that's like a 
huge win for the women and feminist movement. Um, so yeah, and then like like the recent years, well, the feminist movement has been like really focusing this kind of I call it like the green wave, but I don't know how to call it. But it's just like in the whole region, uh, all the feminist movement is trying to. Yeah, like to ask the state like to guarantee abortion and like the access to um, yeah like sexual and reproductive rights and also there is like a really strong movement um, and activism against gender-based violence and that's really strong now. So I would say like now um, the feminist movement and the women like organizations are just trying like to focus a lot in the peace process or like the implementation of the peace agreements, but also like these other uh, issues that are affecting women and yeah, LGBT folks. So yeah, um, uh, yeah, I'm going to go back to the gender subcommission because um, like what they did during the peace agreements. Um, was like really important and it was like all all women women organizations trying to make like a coalition so they can bring to Cuba all these concerns and all these proposals that were going to be included in the peace agreements. But it was mainly because of this and the gender perspective um, included in the peace agreements that when we have the uh, referendum we lost uh, people will know <laughs> for peace. Um, so yeah, I'm going to try to translate what this image is, says because it's just concerning. <laughs> uh, it says, I believe in the original design of family. Um, there's this one that says, Colombia is in danger of going under a communist big, big day. Yeah, that word. <laughs> and like the imminent approval of the gender ideology. It says vote no at the plebiscite, <laughs> and this one it says like we are in favor of family, and yeah, like the family is in danger. I say no to gender ideology. So um, there was like many like factors like involved in why people vote like no in in the referendum, but it was like a really weird moment like for the whole world. I think like uh, yeah, you also hear in the U.S. elected Trump. Um, <laughs> like the yeah, like the Brexit referendum also what were happening like at the same time. So I don't know, like it really was really messed up. Um, so yeah, uh, so that happened. Um, but this like so-called gender ideology um, was really effective. Like I'm um, still like there's still people that use like this concept. Like let's say I'm a I'm a gender ideologist kind of thing. Um, but like my, it's not my theory, but my answer to that is why, why it was so effective is because like uh, patriarchy and militarism have like the same values. Uh, so when you're like defending one thing, you're defending the other. Um, so yeah, yeah, I thought like it was like important to share that because for me it's just it's still, yeah, I don't get it. Um, and also uh, there was another thing, like the gender ideology started because um, there was this kid in like a school, he committed suicide because he was being bullied because he was gay. Um, but he was bullied by the, like the whole school, like teachers and like their partners, no colleagues, I don't know how to call them. Um, so the Ministry of Education like tried to launch this workbook, like to reduce homophobia and transphobia in schools. Uh, but like the most conservative parties were saying like, oh no, you are going to turn all the kids uh, gay or... Uh, so that's where they started to use this gender ideology concept. And also because the gender perspective was included in the peace agreements. Um, so, yeah. Well, yeah, after three years of like... Well, at the end, like the government find like a way to sign, like to start to implement in the peace agreements, even when we lost like the referendum, like they found like, like a constitutional way to do it. Um, so yeah, like the FARC started to demobilize and 
yeah, some people were returning to their territories. Um, but now, like three years after, like um, the implementation has been really slow. Um, it has had l lots of obstacles, and yeah, like the current government doesn't have like the willing to the willingness <laughs> to continue with the process. Um, so yeah, and like I think like two months ago, we well one part of FARC said that they are going to rearm again. So um, that is just like. It's really sad, but also concerning because many people have died because of the peace agreements, like social leaders, and um, yeah, many people, even like demobilized um, FARC fighters. Um, so yeah, so between January first and May, Jan January first of 2016 and May 20th of 2019, um, 837 social leaders and human human rights defenders. Uh, were killed like throughout Colombia, and I think that this is like the highest, um, yeah, statistics we have since the, the the peace agreements, and it doesn't make sense because it's supposed that the FARC was like the enemy, like the public enemy during so many years, but also, um, yeah, they are talking about peace, but the thing is that like communities are still living in war because there's not only like one one group involved but many others um, so yeah I think like the social movements are trying like to stay really strong despite like this context um, so yeah and I, I think like the feeling after the peace agreements were signed is that um, finally like social movements could like focus in something different than ending the conflict uh, because the internal conflict has taken like so much of the political agenda during so many years, so after that, like uh, people start to doing something different and, and asking for different things and working for yeah around different issues. But now, when when we don't know what is happening with the peace agreements and um, people are still being killed, um, yeah, it's always difficult to keep the work. Uh, but for me. Yeah, usually like social movements have to back off and like do something, yeah, come back to the, the way they were working before. Uh, but for me, like the feminist movement uh, have, have like this um, strength uh, because even when they are like still trying to end the conflict, they are focusing on other things that are also important. And that, because peace is not only uh, finishing the armed conflict, it involves many other thing, many other things. So yeah, I think it's like something I really appreciate about like the feminist movement. Um, so yeah. Um, um, yeah, I was just trying like to share with you as well like how women affected by the conflict has like deal has dealt dealt with the yeah like all the things that. They have to. They had to leave because of the armed conflict, and I think that many women have uh, find like a way of coping and like facing violence by organizing themselves and like sharing their stories with other women. Um, so yeah, and I brought like a list of organizations that I thought it was good like you know about. Just if you are interested in the work they do, or um, yeah, you can support them. Any way you find that you can do it. So now you're going to see my amazing skills in PowerPoint animations. <laughs> so, okay, the first one is um, Ruta Pacifica de las Mujeres. Um, they mostly like work in the whole like Pacific <laughs> outside of the um, country, and they usually they they do like really similar things like women in black. Uh, and all like the demonstration they do, like it has like the same, um, yeah, vibe. I don't know. Um, and this, they declare themselves like as pacifist, feminist, and anti-militarist um, group. And yeah, they usually organize like protests and yeah, like big demonstrations in Colombia against the war and gender-based violence. So and yeah, the work they do is just amazing for me. And there's this other, um, it's called Fuerza de Mujeres Guayu. Um, they are mostly based in the north of the country. Um, 
Um, yeah, this organization was created in 2006 with the goal of visibilizing and de denouncing like the violations of human rights uh, that indigenous people uh, were victim of because of mining mega projects. Like there is like this mine, it's called Cerrejon, Cerrejon Mine, and it's like the biggest one, like in like the second big, biggest one, like in in Latin America. Um, so yeah, they are they don't have like access to water or like to yeah, like basic uh, things because of this type of mega projects. And I, actually, there's like two companies that are investing, like from the U.S., that are investing in this in this mine. Um, so yeah, the group they do is also really great. Um, so there's this other organization, and they're based in Bogota, but they were like with women around the country. Um, so yeah, this is more like a like an advocacy, like type of work. Um, so they are always trying to, yeah, like to make reports and like always, um, yeah, like try to enforce like human rights for women. Um, so yeah, and they they also made like many reports about like the peace agreements and how women are like uh, being involved in the implementation. <coughs> There's this other one. I have like a big list, but I will share it <laughs> with you. Uh, it's called Humanas, and um, yeah, they are like a research center with a focus on uh, responding in the situation for women in terms of human rights and international humanitarian law, and yeah, and gender rights in like a context of war. Um, yeah, so there's this other one that is called uh, Red Nacional de Mujeres. That is translated like National Women Network, I think. Um, so it's like a coalition of various organizations uh, or like individual women um, that are trying like to, yeah, like the access like to many human rights and like gender against gender-based violence. Mm. So there's this other one, and they they make like a really awesome work with the access to abortion and uh, yeah, like uh, reproductive and sexual rights for women. Um, okay, so there's this one. And yeah, it's like a N NGO and yeah, like what they basically do is to try to promote like the inclusion of and the respect for the rights and the recognition of the LGBT people uh, in, econo in economics and social and political and, and like in every sphere of life. Uh, so they have like a really nice work. Um, yeah. Uh, there's this other, I think like some of you like were sisters league, you met them in, in the conference. Uh, yeah, they are like an anarchist um, organization. Um, yeah, they do like they focus like on this like queer kind of I don't know like approach to anti-militarism. So it's really it's really good. And yeah, they also make like many resources as well. Um, yeah. So there's like this network of uh, yeah feminist network, anti-militarist network, and they are based in Medellin, and they have this like research center about fem feminicide. Do you use that word? Um, and they always make reports every month about um, yeah how many women have been killed because uh, of their partners, or of, um, like in their own neighborhoods. So they make like this really nice. I mean, it's not nice, <laughs> but like the work they are doing, like trying to um, yeah like recover all these stories and testimonies. I think it's really good. Like because no one is paying attention to these statistics. Um, and there's, there's this one, I think there's, it's like in English is Women's International League for Peace. Um, yeah, they're also like a feminist and pacifist uh, and anti-militarist organization. Um, yeah, they're always working yeah, on how to make like a 
peaceful world, a peaceful uh, country for women. Um, oh well, yeah. So there's like my my reflection on the anti-militarist movement is that it, it is still there's still like lots of work to do. Like feminism is still not like the main priority, and yeah, like some organizations have like been close to this kind of. Um, yeah, like uh, analysis of the situation on why like patriarchy is uh, connected with all that make like war possible and like yeah. So, um, but but I tr I show like, I want to show you like these like names because this is like what what War Sisters International have been like in touch with them. Um, so I'm just hoping that they can realize how this is just me, not not like the. War Sisters International position, I don't know. Uh, but there's like lots of work to do. And yeah, when you don't know uh, what other women have done and what like feminists have done in your own country, you, you are not able like to, um, yeah, like change the way you are like approaching your issues or like your concerns. Um, yeah, that's basically what I brought like for you. Um, for me, it was really important that you know about these organizations because I think that's the way to contribute to what they are doing. And yeah, it's still like like supporting them, like, not like with funds necessarily, but also yeah, like looking what are the, what they are working with and if you can like build like a campaign in your own country along with them. Um, yeah, it could be really good. Um, and yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was such an inspirational presentation. Now we'll open up the floor for questions. Does anybody have a question? Okay, so I'll just take the first one because I have a bunch. Um, so from the last thing you just said, um, I was wondering how can we help? You say we can starting a movement from here we could help. What are some specific things that you see are fundamental that we start here that would really help you back in Colombia? Mm, I think it's basically like to know what is happening outside like your own like community or what you, the work you're doing because sometimes you never like realize what is happening like in other contexts. Uh, for me, that is the first step because, uh, yeah, when you like, you are aware of the ways, like, I don't know, other women in other places are like living, um, or like how they are being affected by violence or by work. Um, I think you can start like to making connections of the the work you are doing, like in your own community or in your own country, and then, yeah, you can try like to to find a way like to make links and yeah, like even like contacting them. But for me, the first step is like to know what is happening somewhere else because sometimes you are just only, I don't know if it's like an expression you have of looking at the, like your belly bottom, like you are just like, yeah, seeing like <laughs> in, uh, inside like your own movement. But yeah, I think that's, that would be like the first step. For 50 years, Colombia was in a struggle with government, was in a struggle with FARC and I was following it, not very uh, profoundly, but following it. And there were a lot of women involved in part. Yeah. And uh, with the gorillas. And I'm wondering what kind of impact these women have brought to their communities once they were demobilized, once they were, they returned. Because being a gorilla is kind of different from being a, yeah, a traditional mohair. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, it's like a really good question, thank you. Um, I think with the demobilized like groups in general, it's been like really difficult for them like to be against in the like civil life after being so many years uh, involved in this uh, armed group because 
many of the demobilized people started like really really young, like 15, 14. So they don't. They are like just trying to uh, get involved in like their communities, but they have. They still have like like an stigma because of yeah being part of uh, that armed group. Um, and the thing is, like Farek uh, be, be, became uh, a political party. So for me, <laughs> it's just like I think it's difficult also for them to like for women like that were like Farek members before to um, start to putting again like in the agenda the, like the whole like discussion that. Uh, the feminist movement has had in like the 70s. It, I think it's just happening, happening again. Um, yeah, and I'm not that close with the like the mobilized women, but I, I do have like some friends that are really like into what the the the, the work they are doing. And yeah, I think it's just really slow. And again, like for me, that is not the option like to be involved in a political party. Uh, for me. It's always going to be like a, like a second priority what women are doing. Um, and there was like this phenomenon after like they demobilized, like all of the girls started like to have babies. Like there's like a um, uh, yeah, this is called baby boom after the demo demobilization. Um, so yeah, I think they're just trying like to like um, yeah, like starting families, but also like trying to be involved in the community that doesn't like them at all. So, yeah. It's something that we struggle here with um, in the United States, but in Colombia, like, how is the movement trying to be more inclusive of um, indigenous women and also Afro-Latinas and Afro-Colombianas? Um, because it's also something that, uh, you know, our fem feminist movement here in the U.S. is also trying to be um, inclusive of indigenous women and um, African-American women here and women of color in general. Well, we we have had like these discussions about like the intersection of oppressions, and it's also uh, something really difficult because I can see now that there's like two two main yeah ways of being involved in the feminist movement. One is like the universities, like academy, academia kind of feminism. And there's this other side that is like the activism with women in communities. Uh, so there's like a like a break in there, just like by starting. Um, and usually, what women uh, like Afro-Colombian uh, women or like indigenous women are trying to do is just like organize themselves. Uh, so that's why I start like with the with the, the first two organizations that I mentioned. I mentioned it's only like one is um, with indigenous people and the other one is like with Afro-Colombian. Um, I think like we are still like questioning uh, the way we, yeah, we are involved in the feminist, um, yeah, act the activism, uh, but I think we have like a long way to to be in that place, like to inclus in be inclusive. Um, yeah, we are like really far from that point. Uh, especially because I think that's like this historically, like the discussion, because you are not like sovereign of the same oppression that other women, so how can you like be, um, or be working with the same uh, people or like dif different people, like, I don't know, like it can be like a prioritization, pri prioritization. <laughs> I'm just trying to translating in my head, but yeah, like they, they can be like a way of pri prioritize uh, struggles, so it's still like, something we are working on, but I think we have like a long way to do it. You were mentioning the similar, like there were similarities between militarism and war and patriarchy, and how, like I want to know like what those connections are, like how are they similar? Mm, I feel like patriarchy is just trying to uh, like make like a, like a, it's like a power structure, I would say. Um, so that's that's when like men are like over women, and what I think what patriarchy does is just um, trying to control and like to is like based in uh, 
do you say, can someone help me? Can I peer? Yeah, <laughs> that's the word. Um, so I think it, it, it shares like the same values in the term in terms of um, so people over others and um, like the the way it affects women like in armed conflict a context and even when there's no war like in peace times like the violence against women is just like the, it's with the same like parents and it just happened. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm just trying to think like the answer, but yeah, I will come back to that <laughs> because yeah, my English is not like working now. But, yeah. Do you find it challenging after we saw those pictures of women and men holding up posters saying, um, "I don't want the the design or the image of the family to disappear"? Do you find it hard to explain feminism? to women whose values are so ingrained in Christianity and um, whose view of family is also really ingrained in their religion and in who they are. So it's, you know, you can't really take their religion away in order to, for them to become a feminist. So how do you reconcile those two things? Yeah, I think it's really difficult like, to, to do that because they're, like, they're not willing like, to listen like what other people have to say about like the, their own values and how they can be like question, questioned. Um, but actually, there's like another organization that I didn't mention. But there's like Catholics for the right to decide something like that, and they're really involved in uh, yeah, like access to abortion and things like that. So I think there's so some women that are just like making other connections and they're trying like to question their own. Uh, religion and their beliefs um, but for me like in this world with uh, internet and books like sometimes it's really difficult like to try to find everyone and try to convince them about what you are supposed to believe it's not like it's not important but it's like trying to explain feminism to men sometimes <laughs> when they are not like involved in feminism um, so I think like for me something like a task I, I already abandoned because not because I, I shouldn't like approach more women and try like to explain them how feminism is just going to change their lives or if they're going like to protect themselves. I don't know. Um, it's just like uh, it's like a really hard process and for me there's some people that you cannot like have like a discussion and they are not open to it. And I never tried like to go to a church or like to go into these spaces to talk with women. Um, so yeah, I don't want to say like you shouldn't do it, but for me it's something that I, I won't like put more effort on it. And for example, like in the workshops, sometimes I facilitate. Uh, there's like uh, women that are really uh, strong with their beliefs and religion. Um, and yeah, like the discussion is not it's not going to be like in the same level. Like I'm from the academia, I'm, I study like at the university, and sometimes those women are not like that well educated. So um, it's just like a way of starting the conversation and just like trying to make them feel uh, that their experience or what they have uh, gone have gone through uh, it has like a connection with. Um, what families are trying to struggle. Um, yeah. Hey, I have a question about. Um, I don't know if it's if, if you have any experiences, like for instance, um, here in the states or from my homeland in the Philippines. Um, <clears throat> in like let's say major socialist parties or bigger coalition. Mm -hmm. Do you, I wonder if you have any um, first-hand experience on women's leadership? Because I feel like a lot of a lot of these parties and whatnot are still led by <coughs> mostly men. Mm -hmm. And and if you do you've seen them like how, has it changed or what? Yeah well um we have been, well, I feel like, like we were like talking about other groups, but um, for example, the Communist Party in Colombia um, is like 
there's like some women doing like work there and they're like trying to uh, include their struggles and their concerns as I mentioned uh, but what I've seen is that uh, women just left uh, those movements because they're not finding like a way to keep working on that or they're they are not feeling like uh, they're being heard, heard. Um, and also uh, there's sometimes like in political parties when there's like uh, allegations I think is the word like for some men like to yeah that have violent some uh, people from their own party uh, so that's just seem like a problem but what I've seen is that uh, many feminists are involved in this kind of uh, yeah like the communist party or something uh, they're just like left and then they're just like doing like another work outside the party because they didn't find like a way to do it. So yeah, I'm yeah. Hi. Uh, one of the things we found really very interesting in our work in the United States mm -hmm. is uh, linking feminism in the United States to the pre-colonization, pre-invasion, pre what would you call that? Pre uh, dominion. Yeah. Uh, before the acquisition of the continent. Yeah. Uh, we kind of trace the roots of American feminism actually to the native uh, tribal societies of the continent. I'm wondering if uh, there is a possibility of doing that in uh, Colombia. I would imagine, yeah? It's the same indigenous... Well, I, I think like Colombia is like a colonized country, so just itself. Um, yeah, we, we have been like victims of like being like a colony from Spain, and even like in, in this century, uh, we're just being still being colonized by the United States and Europe. Uh, so that is, is it still happening. Um, I know that there are some women, not only in Colombia, but in Latin America in general, uh, trying to come back to this kind of, um, yeah, like the original feminism, like before, um, yeah, the colonization, like, I, I know that there are some groups uh, that are really interested in those discussions, but I think it's like a slow process. And anyway, like, yeah, Colombia and Latin America is like a colonized region, um, so we are still suffering from those um, moments. Thank you for that really helpful presentation. It gave me um, time to think about several questions. One is, do you, do you see now that that women feminists are just trying to create separate spaces outside of these more traditional movements, let's say public education or what you just mentioned around like a, a certain political party, even the Communist Party or other, that really, that there's really more a separatist kind of lens that, that they need to create their own spaces to achieve these goals, you know, whether the peace accords are implemented or not. And it, or is it still unclear or is that kind of becoming a clear direction? Sense. It's becoming like a clear duration. Uh, I know there are, there are still like some mixed uh, groups, but I think like as far as I know and like from my experience, um, yeah, like you you can see like more results. Like even you not like results, but like like changes um, when you are like only with women. Like even like you feel like in a safe space like just sharing your stories, or like, yeah, like proposing, like even when you are like in a mixed space, uh, when men are just the ones that are talking, uh, so when you are like in this kind of like separate spaces, uh, yeah, you feel like more confident, like in proposing or like saying what you think, uh, probably like a clear direction, like for some groups, some others are still like trying to find like a balance in this kind of mixed groups, um, but for me, that is like the way <laughs> of doing feminism. It's like my personal uh, opinion. Uh, not because you cannot like discuss with men, um, or yeah, I think that there's still like things you can do. But yeah, for like seeing like changes, 
yeah, when you're like in a separated space, it can happen like more easily. Um, yeah, and it's not only like changing like the general uh, situation of all women, but also like in your personal life. And I think that's the most important thing that feminists can do. Feminism can do like in people's lives when you start like seeing changes like in yourself, in the way that you interact with others, in your relationships. Um, probably it's, like it's it's going to happen soon because. Yeah, what I've seen is like many people is like just uh, leaving parties or leaving like uh, the, the movements because they are not being like women are not being heard, and even like um, um, yeah, like people that are like focusing on LGBT um, yeah like issues, they are also like leaving and trying like to make their own organizing. Mm -hmm. um, so another question. Um, a lot of the activists that have been killed this year and in previous years in Colombia have been environmental activists, uh, specifically also indigenous environmental activists. So I'm wondering from your perspective, how do you see or do you see any connections between the environmental struggles that are happening within Colombia in terms of water conservation and against the mining industry with um, the, the women's movement in the country? Well, I think that all these kind of mega projects and like mining projects and that are trying to extract resources from Colombia, uh, they usually have like private security, but also like these kind of paramilitary groups. Um, so that's why um, like the communities that are trying like to defend their own territory and the, the places they are um, are being like more. Um, yeah, like vulnerable to this kind of violence, like being killed, and there yeah, are many social leaders that are are involving in like the um, trying like to defend their own territory, their water, like the rivers. Um, okay, um, I think there's a connection. I what I've I've read before, and yeah, what I've seen like in many. Uh, groups that are involved in like the environmentalist struggles, um, they, um, yeah, like women are always like had had like a connection with their own lands and their territories. So it's just like a, and sometimes there are like sacred spaces like for many indigenous people. Um, and I think there's like many women doing ama amazing work like in those spheres. Um, yeah, I don't know, like sometimes it's happening so many things, like in so many places that it's really difficult like to make a big movement around like a specific issue. Like sometimes it's like abortion and sometimes it's like uh, public education and sometimes it can be like the extractivism that will be a victim of. Um, but for me, like we are, everyone is doing like something for like what they believe uh, they are supposed like to struggle like. So yeah, I think there's like so many women that are like really involved in that, like this indigenous group that I mentioned, uh, but like so many others that are like, doing like really amazing work in that field. Well, I'd like to thank Natalia. Thank you so much for your presentation, not only and for your work in Colombia. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to say an official goodbye from a firm. This year, at our National Congress, we officially launched the International Department of Affirm. In response to many, many, many requests through the years for us to go to this place or that place and help set up uh, an independent, standalone, self-reliant women's organization, and if possible, the women's movement. Uh, it's kind of a very difficult task. So we have really, really, you know, tried. We opened our first uh, out of the continent, no, not the first, the second outside of the continent chapter uh, this year, Puerto Rico. And it was like, because they asked, you know, we did not go. But they said, we need you, so we went. Uh, we also have a Hawaii chapter. And always in dealing with these situations, we asked the women 
who contact us. Do you want to be a separate country, organization, or do you want to be part of us? We asked the same question of Puerto Rico because we were so aware of its peculiar relationship with the United States government. And they said, because you asked that question, we are certain you will not dominate us. So this is our food. Yes. Uh, next year, I think we will go some other places. So if you wish to keep in touch with us, please uh, just give your email to uh, Francesca over there and Genevieve and Oh, no, I haven't seen your moment. Uh, Marla? Marla. <laughs> Marla. Sorry. Uh, this is the first time I've met her, actually. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, thank you so much. Please have some food, have some coffee. Thank you to Chevy for the baked goods. Thank you to WRL and, and Tori who's been very patient with us. And of course, Fred there is filming. Yes, who else? And thank you very much, Matt. Thank you.